I'm going to show you how I put together this powerful LED light for about $50 worth of parts. We will use all of these parts you see here. Some I bought online, others you can find locally or even free. I have a blog post listing all of the parts I used and links to where you can buy them. The link is in the description of this video or click the card. I took inspiration for this design from two other videos which I'll link to in the description of this video and in my blog post. So take a look at those to give you more ideas. One difference in mine is I'm using wall power rather than a battery just to keep things simple. Let's start with the electronics. At the heart of this is a set I bought on eBay. Included is a 100 watt LED chip, an LED driver that accepts either 120 or 240 volt AC and puts out 30 volt DC and 3 amps, a heat sink with a fan, as well as a lens and the hardware to keep it on. It also came with this thing but I couldn't figure out how to use it. Since this LED is very bright I want to be able to dim it. This driver doesn't really support dimming but it kind of does. I found this spot on the circuit that's marked with VR meaning variable resistor, so I suspected that connecting a potentiometer there will dim the output. So I tested it out and I was right. This is a 10 kilo ohm logarithmic potentiometer that I'll use as my dimming knob, but I will also use a 10 kilo ohm trim potentiometer. This will allow me to cap the maximum output. I'll show you why shortly. To connect these, I'm using some wire I pillaged from some ScrabCat 5 cable. Stranded cable is better, but solid will work too. I'll need two wires about 5 or 6 inches each. The first wire connects to the middle of the three pads. I like to stab the hole with the soldering iron first, then try to push the wire through the hole while heating it up. The other wire will go in either of the other pads, it doesn't matter which one since they're both connected for some reason. The other end of the wires will be soldered to the potentiometer. The one from the middle pad on the circuit goes to the middle pin on the potentiometer. The other one goes to one of the outside pins. Take note of which pin I'm soldering it to. It does matter since if you solder it to the opposite pin, then you'll be turning the knob counterclockwise to brighten the light rather than clockwise as you'd normally expect. Now we'll connect the trim potentiometer. Take the pin furthest from the knob and bend it right out of the way. We don't need it. The other two pins will solder to the corresponding pins on the other potentiometer. Middle to middle, outside to outside. In all honesty, it's easier to solder the two potentiometers together first, then put the wires on, since the wires tend to pop off once you heat the solder again. I ended up having to re-solder the wires. Once it's done, I bend the potentiometer back just a bit to make sure it fits properly in our case later. Now we can deal with the LED chip. I ended up cutting these tabs off this time because I forgot that I actually used them in the first one I built. They are actually connected to the positive and negative poles of the chip, it is a little bit more convenient to use them, but in any case, I didn't use them this time. You'll see the plus and minus signs on the chip. The white wire goes to the positive, and then the black wire goes to the negative. Try not to put too much solder on there, since it needs to keep a low profile. Now we can test it. I'll start by setting the LED on the heatsink, since it will get hot enough to burn you even in the short time we have it on. To test, I'm going to shove the red wires into a power cable. No, this isn't the safest way, so be careful. And it works. Verify that turning the potentiometer clockwise turns the brightness up, and counterclockwise turns it down. Then we can calibrate the trim potentiometer. You'll hear faint clicks when it's turned all the way up. Then keep turning it down till you notice the slightest difference in the light output. It will take several rotations before any change is noticed. I don't show it here, but I measured the current draw when doing this. At full output, it was drawing 2.75 amps. After calibrating the trim potentiometer, I brought that down to 1.75 amps. That means about one full amp was being wasted on heat rather than light output. And indeed, after capping the current output in this way, the LED is only warm to the touch rather than burning hot. And now you'll finally see a difference in the light output. Once you see that, turn it back up a bit and leave it there. Now we can turn our attention to the fan. First, we need to separate it from the heatsink. They're held together by these retaining clips, so we'll cut those off, and the bolt and spring slides right out. We don't need the connector, so that can go. In fact, the whole yellow wire can go, since that's for controlling the fan speed, and we won't be using it. Now we can see a problem. The fan doesn't fit inside the pipe that we're going to be using as a case because of these tabs, so let's just cut them off. Be careful, they'll go flying. 
but after they're all off, it fits nicely. Now we have to power this thing. It's rated for 12 volts, but we already eliminated most of the heat problem, and I'm planning to use this light for video production, so I want to keep the noise down, so I'm not going to run it at full speed. Instead, I'm going to use a 5 volt USB charger. I'm sure we all have a charger lying around that we hate because it doesn't charge our phone fast enough, so here's your chance to tear it apart. There may be a screw you can feel under the sticker which makes things easy, but in my case I had to cut it open. I found it's easiest to start at the USB port and work your way around. Eventually it'll open up and you can take the circuit out. Then cut the wires that go to the plug. Now we can remove the wires from the circuit board. The USB port is harder to remove, and I guess it's not totally necessary, but it does make it easier to put the new wires on. To get it off, I had to keep pulling on the USB port while going back and forth heating all six solder joints. Eventually, It took a while, but it came off. Now we can put the new wires in. I'm again using wires from that Cat5 cable I took apart. Start with the power input wires and put them in where the old ones came out. I'm putting them in with the board facing up so I can see where I'm putting them, then I'll flip it over to add some more solder to make it secure. On the board, under where the USB port was, there are holes marked with a plus and minus sign. This is where we need to solder the wires from the fan. The red wire is positive and the black wire is negative. Now we need to give this power. Fortunately, this LED driver has a couple of unused pads that are directly connected to the red wires, that is, the AC power input, so we'll use those. Since this is AC at this point, it doesn't matter which wire you put where. Now we can test it out. Let's hook it up again and make sure the fan spins up, and it looks good. At this point, it's helpful to put some hot glue on each of the small wires where they're soldered to the board. This is just to give the wire support. We're going to be moving this around a lot, and the hot glue will keep the wires from breaking from all the bending. This is more important with solid wire, but it helps even if you used stranded wire too. We'll do this on the potentiometer too. Let's move over to the heatsink now. It has the same problem as the fan did. It won't fit in the pipe. And the problem is these brackets where those bolts were. So I'm going to use a Dremel tool with a cutoff wheel to cut them all off. Just go slowly up and down both sides to wear it down. Once you're mostly through, you can use pliers to break it off. Do that on all four, and then it will fit in the pipe. Now let's attach the LED chip to the heatsink. To do that, I'm going to use 1 8 inch bolts that are 1.5 inches long. We'll first have to find a position that we can put this LED where all four holes line up between fins on the heatsink. Take a mental note of where that is. Then we can add some heatsink compound under the LED chip. Put it back in that position and feed all the bolts through. I chose 1 8 inch bolts intentionally since they are a tight fit between the fins. You can either screw them in or just push really hard. I have this sitting on top of the fan since the bolts will go further than the bottom of the heatsink. That little bit extra we'll use to put the nuts on. Once they're all on, snug them down with a screwdriver and a wrench on the nut. It doesn't need to be super tight, so don't go crazy. Now let's attach the heatsink to the fan. With the bolts sticking out underneath, it only fits on the fan in certain positions where it doesn't interfere with the fan, so make note of how it fits. Then lift the heatsink and put hot glue in the middle of the fan and put the heatsink back in the same position and hold it down momentarily until the glue cools. And there we have it. I should have mentioned make sure the label of the fan faces away from the heatsink and also make sure that the fan spins freely. Now that the internals are all done, let's turn our attention to the case. For that, I'll start with 4 inch PVC pipe. We'll need a 10 inch long piece. I have another video about how to cut pipe straight. The quickest way is to use a miter saw and finish it up with a handsaw, but if you don't have a miter saw, take a look at that video and learn how to do it without power tools. Whichever method you use, you'll have a straight cut, but not smooth. It's not necessary to smooth it out, but it'll make it look better. I used the power sander first, then I followed it up by using sandpaper on a flat surface. And this is how it looks after. Still a couple nicks, but it's good enough. And now that it's the right length, we need to cut some holes in it. These are the components that we need holes for. First, the handle. This was honestly the cheapest cabinet handle I could find at the store. Then the power socket. I'm using an IEC 320C8 socket. Since the cables are so common, you can probably find one for free. 
to allow mounting to a tripod, I'll be adding a quarter twenty threaded insert. There are lots of different kinds of these. This one is meant to be pushed in, others can be screwed in. For the power switch, I'm using a round one, since it's easier to make a round hole than a square one. And we'll also need a hole for the potentiometer. This is the knob I'll use on the outside. I need to mark where I want to make the holes, but I want to make sure they're on the exact top, bottom, and side. I'll begin by measuring the circumference of the pipe in centimeters, since it's easier to divide, and it conveniently comes out to exactly 34 centimeters. Divide that by 4 and we get 8.5 centimeters. Make one mark at the edge, then measure 8.5 centimeters around, and make another mark, then do it again. I only need three, since there won't be anything on the one side. To extend these lines, I'm using a level just sitting on the table. Line up the top of the level to the first mark and extend the line all the way across. Do the same thing on the other two marks. This is a good time to decide which side is which, so I'll mark the side, front, top, and bottom. Now that we decided what is top, we can mark where the holes for the handle need to go. First, we need to know the distance between the two screws. In this case, that's three and three quarter inches. Divide that by two and you get one and seven eighths. So, start by marking the very center of the pipe at five inches. Then we need to mark one and seven eighths either side of that mark. Once both are marked, check that it actually matches the handle. These holes need to be five thirty seconds of an inch big so the screws can fit through, so I'm going to mark that here too. Now I'll mark the side for the power switch and the potentiometer. This is fairly arbitrary, but I'm going to put the power switch at two and a quarter inches from the back and the potentiometer one and a half inches away from that. Then I'll mark the sizes on here too. The hole for the switch needs to be three quarter inches, and the hole for the potentiometer needs to be five sixteenths. The hole for the power plug needs to be a half inch by one inch rectangle. It can't be too close to the back, so I'll put it an inch away. I'll also make marks one quarter of an inch from each side. I'll show you why later. The last hole to mark is for the threaded insert. I want this dead center too, so I'll put it at five inches. And this one I'll drill at three eighths of an inch, which is a little small, but I want it to be a tight fit. So now we can drill out all the holes at the sizes we marked. For the bigger sizes, I drilled pilot holes with small bits first just to make sure I got the right spot. That's pretty uneventful except for the power socket. I'm using a half inch spade bit which I'll center on those quarter inch marks I made. Then I'll cut it into a rectangle with a utility knife. Be careful of course, it's easy to slip and cut yourself. When testing the fit, the size is perfect but you'll notice that it pops right out. That's because the wall of the pipe is too thick for the clips on the side of the socket to grab. So, using the knife again, I'll thin the wall of the pipe on both sides of the socket until it can grab. It's still not perfect, but we can take care of it later. We have a small issue with the power switch too. It has a ridge on top that we need to make room for. To do that, I'll file it till it fits. Now let's move to the caps for each end of the pipe. I'm using these 4 inch floor drains which I found at Home Depot. They turned out to be perfect, except for the length of that part that goes inside the pipe. It's far too long for the back as you see here, but it's more of a problem at the front, so we'll need to cut that off. If you only have a handsaw, you can slide a pipe clamp on this and cut against the clamp. It'll give you the same results. I'm going to do this on a table saw. I made this table saw sled a while ago with the help of other YouTubers, which makes this much easier. I'll use a scrap plywood to keep the lip of the drain off the table saw. I'll first make sure the edge is half an inch from the blade, then I'll cut only halfway through. I'll leave the plywood in place and use it as a guide to cut the drain. While doing this solves one problem, it does create another. The original edge has a bevel that allows it to fit into the pipe, and I just cut that off. So now it won't go into the pipe. I'll have to give it a new bevel. To do that, I'll first put a stove bolt through the middle of this with a nut on the other end and tighten it down. That can then be put in a drill and run over coarse grit sandpaper stabilized with a block of wood. This definitely took a while, but eventually it finally fit. It just needs to be small enough to get it started, the rest can be forced in. Since you can see the brand name on this, and I didn't want to see that on the final product, I sanded it off. In fact, I sanded the whole thing just to give it an even texture. And I did the same with the pipe too, it's good prep for painting. But we're not quite ready to paint yet. One of these is going to go over the LED, so we need to put a hole in it for the lens. Fortunately, the size we need lines up pretty closely with one of the circles in the grate. 
To cut it, I'll feed a hacksaw blade through the hole. Then reattach the saw to the blade and I'll cut all the way around the circle. Eventually the middle will pop out and you can detach the blade again to remove it. Now we can use a knife to clean up the ridges that are left over. It doesn't need to be a super clean cut, however we do need to make sure that when it's sitting on the heat sink, the reflector can sit flat on the LED. And it can't yet, so there is more work to do. This reflector is somewhat square on the bottom, so with a pencil I marked where each ridge is. Then using the knife again, I cut those spots at an angle. Eventually it did fit together snugly. Now we can prepare these for painting. First, I'll drill a hole in the edges of these so that I can hang them up to paint. And since we just did all that work to make sure these fit in the pipe, we don't want to be adding any paint to where these connect, otherwise they may not fit anymore. So I'll be using painter's tape to cover the part that slides inside. Same idea with the pipe. Tape around the inside of both sides of the pipe. To hang these up while I paint, I'm using rebar ties with one end cut off. For the pipe, I'll feed it through the hole for the threaded insert. Then, for each cover, I'll use the hole we drilled. To paint it, it's important to use plastic paint. If it says all-purpose and claims it's okay for plastic too, it's not. They're lying. It has to be specifically for plastic only. I took them outside and hung them up in a tree to paint them. Use nice, thin, even coats. Make sure to get it from all angles. Inside the grates of the covers, under the pipe, inside the pipe, just so you don't see white inside, it doesn't need to be perfect. It was a little bit windy this day, so I had to turn them around to get the other side. If you do, make sure you don't, yeah, drop it. It was okay, though, I dusted it off and kept painting. After several hours, I brought them inside and started taking off the tape. Be careful when you do that that you don't peel any of the paint, although even if you do, it likely won't be seen anyway. The first piece to go in is the threaded insert. I did make some effort to make sure it fit, but it still doesn't even if I try to force it. So I'll use a file to make some extra room and a star pattern to match the ridges on the insert. Eventually it'll go in with several whacks of a hammer. Clearly it's in there pretty tight and that's on purpose. This is what will support it on top of a tripod so if this fails the whole thing will hit the ground. So to make extra sure I'm also going to epoxy this in. My weapon of choice is JB Weld. Once mixed, spread it all around the insert, pushing it into those spikes on the side and into the hole in the pipe. I might have had better results using my finger with a glove on, but it doesn't have to look pretty. This is how I left it. So I'll leave that for 24 hours to set up, and that'll allow the paint to harden up too before we start poking at it more. In the meantime, we can prepare the electronics to go in. You may have noticed earlier that both the fan and the heatsink were very loose inside the pipe. To fix that, I'm going to use this foam sheet that actually came in the box this was shipped in. Cut it to size, but only around the fan. I don't want to interfere with the heat dissipation of the heatsink. To hold it on, I'll use hot glue. But first, I'll tack the wires in place between the fins of the heatsink. Then I can put the foam on with hot glue. I'm using a shorter piece of foam between the wires so I don't go over the wires and make it too thick to fit in the pipe. Then I'll put the bigger piece on. To finish it off, I tack the wires down between the foam. There's nothing more we can do until that epoxy sets up, so we'll come back tomorrow. Tomorrow. Let's get this handle put on. With the screw inside the pipe, you can screw some of the handle on by hand, but not very much. I found the best way is to use a small socket with a screw bit. The first screw you can get on by turning the whole handle. The second screw you can't, of course, and you have to turn the screw from the inside. It took a few minutes, but eventually it got there. Once done, it looks like this. It's nice and secure, and I'm happy with it. Next, we can drop the electrical components in. I ended up putting a little too much hot glue on the wires, so it was a tight fit, but that's really a good thing. It's less likely to move later. It needs to be pushed in, but not too far, only until the heatsink is just below the edge. Then we can put the cap on, and it will push the heatsink the rest of the way. Again, it's a tight fit, but that's good. To hold the lens in, I'm going to use another four bolts, just like the other bolts, but these will dig into the fins of the heatsink. I use my Dremel to cut a small notch in them, which essentially makes them self-tapping, so they'll cut threads into the fins of the heatsink. To put it together, the reflector goes on first, but oh yeah, this is the last chance we have to clean the LED, so make sure there's no dirt on it. So the reflector goes on, then the lens. 
Next comes the bracket, but because our design leaves a gap between the bracket and the lens, I'm adding this piece of 14 gauge wire that I've shaped into a spring washer so that it keeps the lens from moving around. So that goes on top and it'll be held in by those screws. I'm aiming to put those screws between fins on the heatsink just beside where we put the other screws in, since those fins are already being pushed together, so it should be a tighter fit. Once you have the threads started by hand, then use a screwdriver to tighten them down. You'll have to be careful that they stay straight, but also don't push down. Just turn them and let the threads dig in and pull them down. Once you get them near the bottom, stop. You don't need to pull them right down to the plastic, you just need them to stop anything from moving. Now we can move to the back of the light. The potentiometer comes with this tab on it, which is meant to keep it from twisting in place, but I didn't make a hole for it, so I'm just going to break it off. Feed it into the hole and put the washer and nut on and tighten it down. You should probably use the right tools for this so you don't scratch the fresh paint. Now I'll add hot glue to the bottom of the LED driver to keep it in place. The glue doesn't hold well to the metal, but it will grab well on the heat sinks on both sides. So I'm making a continuous line from one side to the other. Then I'll add a massive gob of glue to the bottom. Once I think I have enough, I'll stick it where I think it should go, then turn the whole thing right side up so the glue settles onto the bottom of the pipe. I did something similar with the little transformer for the fan, except I stuck it to the side of the pipe. Once the glue cools, it's fairly secure in there. Now we can take care of the last of the soldering. First I'll solder a short wire onto the power switch. For this, you should try to match the thickness of the wire going into the LED driver. I'm using 18 gauge speaker wire. Once that's done, feed one of the wires from the LED driver through the hole where the power switch will go and solder that to the switch too. Then it can go into the hole and push till it's in there securely. Moving on to the power input, pull out the last wire from the LED driver and the one from the power switch. Both of these will go onto the power socket. Then the socket can be pushed into place. Now I'll test it out quickly. Plug it in, turn it on, and it works. Testing the dimming knob, that works too. Awesome. That power socket is still a bit loose, so I'm going to put some hot glue around it to keep it from pulling out when I pull the power cord. To put the knob on the potentiometer, first turn it all the way up, then put the knob on so the line is at the 5 o'clock position. This knob just pushes on. Before we put the back on, we should make sure that the wire is not interfering with the fan, otherwise they'll stop the fan. So you may have to reach in and pull them back, and maybe pull the wires behind some of the electronics so that they stay out of the way. Assuming we have that taken care of, the back can go on. It's a tight fit, so I held it against my chest to get the leverage I needed. And there it is. Finally complete. Combine this with an umbrella, and it's fantastic for video lighting. And in fact, I'm using it for lighting this video right now. And since this is the second one that I put together, I can combine it with a little old work light that's right behind me and get that all important three point lighting setup. Now I told you at the beginning of this video that it cost me about $50 to put one of these together. Do you want to see the numbers? Well, keep in mind that these are the numbers that I paid in 2017. So prices might have changed by the time you're watching this. That said, if you put together everything that you need to buy to put this together and exclude the things that I'm sure you can find for free, it comes out to about, well, what did I tell you, 50 bucks. It was actually a little bit cheaper for me because I had the pipe left over from a plumbing job. Now, if you do decide to make a second one, the price comes down a bit. And that's because a lot of the smaller components are so cheap that you can't even just buy one by itself. So you already have enough for your second one. That brings the price of the second one down to about $30. All of that's not counting the umbrellas or the umbrella holders, but those are pretty inexpensive too. I'll include links to those as well as to everything I used on my blog post. So be sure to check that out. And if you do actually put one of these together, please let me know. I'd love to know. And if you run into any snags, need some help, please ask. I'll do my best. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video.